hello everyone uh, thank you for uh, attending today's open sys meeting and today we have uh, professor shinzen lu uh, and he is the head of the institute of disaster prevention and mitigation from sin singhua university sorry if i'm pronouncing wrong but no, no problem okay singhua yeah. university okay bye sin uh, yeah. singhua university okay it's okay okay no problem yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thank you for accepting to present, and we are looking forward to you. It's all yours now. Thank you. Okay. So can I start now? Yeah, go for it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So thank you for the invitation, and thank you everyone to come to this uh, presentation. I know that many of you are in the middle night or quite early in the morning. So sorry for. Bring the trouble to you, and uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity to introduce of some of the work I have done in my group uh, on the open seas. Uh, of course, together with uh, uh, my students, I think uh, Dr. Yuan Tian, he is the second also of this presentation. He is also in the the group, and he gave uh, us a lot of contribution on the on the model developing in open seas. So why we call this dam is multi-scale urban seismic damage simulation is because that uh, we want to use open seas not only for the building scale but also extend it to the building scale to the city scale, so we can find the more uh, potential opportunity of using open seas for the uh, earthquake engineering. So first of all, I come to the the background of the research. Of course, here is the map in of China. We can see that after the 1976 Tangshan earthquake. There is about 40, uh, 45 years. There is no major earthquake in the uh, pop <coughs> density population area of mainland China, so that the the city are not uh, have enough knowledge about uh, what will happen when earthquake uh, uh, start uh, in China's uh, big cities. For example, that uh, China is constructing a lot of tall buildings, and many of the tall buildings is among the tallest building in the world. But uh, uh, fear of the tall building, such kind of super tall building, have the appearance of a strong earthquake. So we want to know that how to design the buildings to be safe in big earthquakes. And uh, also that uh, many Chinese cities, for example, the city of Beijing, where I'm located, uh, have already are also have some very big earthquake risk. Uh, in about uh, <coughs> uh, 300 years ago, there is a magnitude of eight earthquake happens just in the east uh, suburban area of Beijing. So if this earthquake happens again in nowadays Beijing, so what will happen? So this is also a big challenge, particularly when we not only care about the safety, or, but also care about the resilience of these uh, important cities. And because we don't have the uh, sufficient uh, data or experience uh, for the earthquake to the top buildings of the big cities in China. So the only thing we can do is that we go back to the <coughs> fundamental of structure dynamics. We input the ground motions into the buildings and we can know the, what happens when the earthquake uh, occurs in the top buildings. And uh, we can use uh, the similar idea, input the ground motion to a uh, structure dynamics model of a city and we can predict the seismic damage to the city. So this is uh, the fundamental idea that we can call the, 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 the upper one is the nonlinear time history, history analysis of a building. And the bottom one is the nonlinear time history analysis of a city or city scale time history analysis. So this is uh, what we call a much scale simulation. And uh, we want to bring all these uh, different scale simulation into open seas. So this is uh, uh, the fundamental idea of research. And uh, first, of all, when we come to the top building, for example, we have this uh, kind of uh, building more than three, four, five, or six hundred meters. And what kind of model we can use it to, to set up the new near simulation model of these super tall buildings? And uh, I think that uh, uh, we did it work more than 10 years ago, and uh, we use this fiber beam element model and a multi layered shear element model to simulate the beam or columns or the shear wall slabs of the super tall building. So when we finish this super tall building, uh, finish the modeling, and we also bring the element deactivation technology, so we can simulate the collapse of this super tall building. So here is a two typical example. The left one is the tallest building in Beijing. So it has uh, have a height more than 500 meters. 
And uh, the right one is the tallest building in China. Uh, it's a Shanghai called Shanghai Tower with a height is more than 600 meters. So this, uh, the Shanghai Tower simulation is finished uh, in 2009 and the uh, Beijing uh, C15 building uh, collapse simulation is finished in, was finished in 2013. Uh, so actually that with this fiber being animal model or multi-layer shared model, actually we can simulate the collapse behavior of these uh, tallest buildings in the world. And uh, the formal simulation are generally based on the commercial software. We all know that the commercial software is a black box and many of people technology we can don't know. And uh, the National Science, Natural Science Foundation of China, they set up a big project for more than eight years. And they want to know the detailed mechanism of this uh, simulation. So we want to use some um, uh, open source code that uh, can understand the the detailed behavior or detailed mechanism of this kind of simulation. So we tend to open this. And, uh, but the challenge of this simulation is uh, particularly a very challenging for open source at that time uh, in 2012 or uh, 13, that the degree of freedom, the number of elements and number of uh, sections, uh, you can see this is some of the top buildings that we simulated in my group. And uh, you can see that this, uh, models are much, much bigger than the, the models we read in the papers with OpenSeas. So we get this job to, okay, we, we, we want to simulate the class of the large scale structure using OpenSeas. This is the task to us. And uh, I talked to my students, okay, let's conquer the mountain. But when we begin the work, we find that we're not conquer the mountain, but we need to conquer the mountain. Why? because it is not only one problem, that is a many problems one by one. For example, firstly, we need a good model to simulate the shear walls. So in 2013, we derived a multi-layered shear element model for shear walls. And then quickly after that, we know that, okay, we don't have the sufficient solver to handle these uh, big structures. So we need to a uh, high performance computing solver, the GPU solver for OpenSys. We do it in 2014. And then after that, we can build a model, we can solve it. We can find that, okay, the shear element in the open is not good enough. We still need a new shear element to simulate the large deformation behavior of open seas. So we developed a new shear element, the NLGKGQ in 2015. And after the element, we also find that the algorithm, the matrix solver is not good enough, dynamic uh, solver is not good enough to handle this uh, strong nonlinear problem. So we need to develop a basic algorithm for class simulation. This work is done in 2017. So, so that uh, it is a uh, uh, work spanned for many years and we're still working on this to solve these problems. And also that uh, in recent days, we developed some new uh, damping models to uh, solve some of this uh, special problem with this open thing. So, so this is the, the whole, whole uh, research uh, routine of our, in our group. And uh, today I will uh, introduce some of the key uh, topics that uh, the problem, for example, how to model the uh, concrete structure, we need to share and manage, how to uh, build the big model, how to do the light deformation simulation, how to uh, solve the convergence problem, how to use a better dumping model, and also uh, how we can extend it, this technology, not only for one building, but to a, a city with uh, many, many buildings. Okay, so firstly is that uh, the shear, multi-layer shared element model. So, so the pr principle of the multi-layer shared element model, actually this is a quite uh, mental uh, idea in composite material mechanism that uh, we have a shear element, we developed into many different layers. You can compare it with the fiber beam element. The fiber beam element is that you have a beam element developed in many small zones, we call it a fiber. And in the multi-layered shear element, you have a shear element, you divide, uh, divide it into many different layers. So it's called many layer shear element. That different layers uh, uh, work with the plan plan assumption. And so we can simulate this uh, uh, coupled actual compression, tension, uh, bending shear behavior. So this is a very uh, adaptive shear element model. Of course, we can put different uh, uh, reinforcement layers into this uh, uh, shear element to simulate different uh, arrangement of reinforcement. And then we developed the, the entire uh, framework 
to input this shellment uh, element into the uh, open seas. So we begin with this material model. We need a concrete model, a reinforcement model, and we build the reinforcement layer or concrete layer. And then we need to uh, section to represent the, uh, the different layers. And we put each section into the a different shell element. Then we can build the material shell element model. That this model have already uh, embedded into human in um, many, many years ago. I think uh, seven, six years ago. So here is uh, some typical simulation that uh, for some simple shear walls, uh, this uh, much layer shearment can have the similar simulation behavior with the fiber element. But if we come to the short wall or come to the coupled walls, then the shear element will be uh, better than the existing models. And uh, I think uh, all these models can be downloaded from the website. You can clearly see the trickle fire of this uh, uh, shear element. <laughs> And uh, also that with this shear element, together with the fiber element, we can really build up some of the uh, top building models. Here is a typical example of this top building. Uh, I think you can download the Chico fiber, uh, fire, uh, fire of this uh, top building from this website. You can clearly see how we build the model and how we do the calculation. And you can see that this uh, calculation result is agree quite well with uh, commercial software. So this is uh, the first step. And then we need to handle the modeling challenge because, uh, for example, that uh, actually for some top buildings, they have the shear walls in the middle, they have frame outside. If you directly use the shear MITC4 element, it only have five degree of freedom per node. And uh, for the beam element, they have a six degree of freedom per node. So that uh, you need some special technology to connect this uh, shear element to the uh, being elements. And also that uh, you can see that for such kind of top building with uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, component, it, uh, uh, it is impossible to write the tickle fire to, tickle fire to uh, develop this uh, uh, top building model. So we need a uh, GUI uh, pre-processed uh, uh, tool. So we developed a tool to uh, uh, from the MSC software to OpenSys and uh, output the result to the MSC so that you can directly compare the result and also this uh, uh, code can be found from this website address. And here we can see that uh, with this technology, you can clearly see the shaking of this tall building and the result is come from the OpenSys and it's much more uh, easy to see the, the, the result. And also that uh, when we, working, when we were working on the OpenSys for the large scale simulation, that uh, at that time, the OpenSys is only 32 byte version. So they cannot handle with the model bigger than two gigabytes. So we need to recompile the OpenSys into the 64 byte environment so that uh, the OpenSys can occupy as much memory as you can have your computer. So we can handle a very big model. But uh, it's easy to say that, okay, we recompile the OpenSys, but actually they take us more than several months to finish all this job because we need to recode and recompile the laboratory, the surrounding every one by one to, to finish this job. And also when we come to the very big model, we can see that the world is uh, quite different. For example, we have many different metric solvers, but most of these uh, metric solver we are quite familiar with cannot work with this very big, big model because that uh, nobody ever tried this model for, the, for, for, tried this matrix solver for such a very big model. Only the SPAS SM, uh, SYM model is uh, uh, feasible for this kind of simulation. And uh, also for the constraint and even for the Egan solver, we can see that uh, when we come to the very big model, this uh, take quite a lot of time to do the trial error process to find the really feasible solver for this big problem. And uh, the second, uh, the, the, the third topic is about the how to simulate the largest formation of the shear wall. And uh, we need a shear wall, Foxy, firstly, we want to simulate the class. So we need to know uh, not only the nonlinear of geometric nonlinear, but also the material nonlinear. Okay. And also that it is uh, insensitive to mesh distortion because the real world structure is quite complicated. We cannot uh, uh, guarantee our mesh is a very uh, uniform. And uh, we want to make our model have six degree of freedom per node so that you can be 
easily connected to the Bing element. And also that uh, people are quite familiar with the MITC4 element, so want the Chico file is very similar to that one. So we developed a shell element called NLGKGQ. It's uh, the, the combination of the membrane, membrane element GQ12 and the binding matter DKQ. So this is the fundamental idea of this element. The, 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 the detail of this element can be found this, from this paper. And uh, Dr. Tian, he writing the paper. He quite uh, well, know quite well with this fundamental of this element. And uh, this is the geometric nonlinear formula of this uh, uh, NLGKGQ uh, shear element. And this element uh, uh, and also in the opposite. And here is a typical example. For example, uh, we can have the thinking cylinder, we have a point lot on that. We can see that, okay, this model have a much more better accuracy and the MITC4 element and also the S4 element in abacus. And for the mesh distortion problem, we can see that uh, this model, this element is much better than the MITC4 element. And this element, this example is a typical example for larger deformation. You can see that you have a beam here, you can rotate the beam, and finally the, 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 the two ends come to together, and all elements can simulate this connection quite well. And of course, that we can use the element for the shear wall simulation, you have the similar behavior with this uh, MITC4 element and other elements. And uh, this is two in interesting examples. The first example is uh, we have a column here. We have this uh, cantilever column with the extra load and the horizontal load. And if you use this uh, MITC4 element, the result is not good because that uh, the MITC4 element have a serious knocking problem for this uh, uh, column. But with the, our new element, you can see that the red one, the simulation result, agree quite well with the dot nine. That is a test result. And uh, the second example is that uh, we call it uh, a progressive class simulation or the cantilever behavior that we push a beam and they come to a very light deformation. We can see that come, when we come to the light deformation, our MIT, uh, our NLTQ, GQ element performs much better than the MITC4 element. So these uh, two examples demonstrate the geometry non entity and the material non entity come together. Uh, uh, examples. And uh, the MIDKGQ element is a four nodes shear element. We also developed uh, another element called NLDKG shear element. It has only three nodes. As the idea is similar to the NLDKGQ, but uh, it, uh, this three node triangular element is more adaptive to some wrapping uh, behavior. The paper of this element can be found from this uh, uh, paper. And you can see that it can work quite well with this uh, uh, cylinder or with this twist beam problem, and uh, the result is quite good. And uh, here is an example that we have a shaped, uh, S shaped uh, uh, steel column. We have a lot on the medium of the web. So, with the load increase, the web of the, the shaped steel comes to Buckle, local buckling occurs, and uh, the NLGK GT element have uh, better nonlinear simulation capacity than the NLGK GK GQ element. So, because they have uh, this element have a triangular element, so can better simulate the local buckling with the wrapping behavior in the web plate. Okay. So with this element, with this uh, 64 byte version, we can simulate some very big uh, structure in the real world. For example, this is the Shanghai Tower we mentioned before. This is, I think uh, this is one of the tallest buildings in the world. The simulation result from very strong earthquake agree quite well with this commercial software. Another example is this uh, Z15 tower and result is also agree quite well with this uh, uh, commercial software. And you can see that the size of this uh, uh, model is uh, very, very big. And also we can do it for some other structure. For example, this is called the Chengzhou Street Bridge. It is uh, maybe one of the longest building in the world, uh, bridge in the world. The main span will be 1.5 kilometers. And uh, we can use this element to simulate this uh, uh, bridge and we can simulate the nonlinear behavior. And also we can use this shear element to simulate the nuclear plant 
and contaminant and the result is also quite well. Okay, so now we come to the explicit algorithm that uh, we all know that for the struct dynamics, we have two different algorithms. The first is the implicit one, and the second family is the explicit one. And when we use the implicit algorithm, we always find some convergency problem, particularly when we come to the CLAP simulation. And for the explicit algorithm, it will be much more flexible. So currently, the explicit algorithm with the central difference method is widely used. And I think many of you are quite familiar with the central difference method in OpenSys. However, when we use this central difference method together with this uh, really damping that we can see that the, the math matrix and the damping matrix on the left side of this equation. And uh, this equation, when we come to inverse this equation, it's quite time consuming. So if we can change it to the leaf -hook method, we move the uh, damping matrix to the right side of these uh, equations, we can make the simulation much more faster. And here is the comparison. We can see that if we move from the central difference method to the leapfrog method, then we can have a multi, more than 40 times speed up. And uh, why we come to this explicit algorithm is that we can use this explicit algorithm to simulate some very large deformation behavior. For example, for this one, the, the left one is a collapse simulation of a tall building, and right one is a collapse simulation of a bridge you can see that this kind of deformation, deform displacement scale is a real displacement. We don't have any magnifier of this displacement. And if, if we use the implicit algorithm, we cannot go to such kind of very large deformation or the crap simulation because of the convergency problem. But when we shift to the explicit algorithm that we can clearly see the real world collapse of this uh, big building. And, uh, when we have this uh, capacity of the CLAP simulation, we can further improve our uh, study on CLAP. For example, when we're talking about the CLAP resistance of uh, frames, we have different CLAP uh, uh, CLAP uh, criteria. For example, in Chinese design code, two percent of interstory drift ratio will be regarded as CLAP. And uh, for example, in FEMA, the, the interstory drift ratio may be four percent. And uh, in FEMA 350, the slope of idea will be smaller than 20% of the initial slope, then it will be regarded as class. And we can also give some uh, more explicit uh, class criteria is that if your deformation of the structure, vertical deformation structure is very big, then we think the structure will class. So we have different criteria for the definition of class. And which one will be <coughs> more reasonable? So we can do the simulation. We can see that, okay, so here is the idea curve and uh, or <coughs> collapse frigidity curve. And we can see that the blue one is the criteria one with 2% of drift ratio. The green one is the 4% drift ratio. The black one is the 20% of initial slot. And the red one is the one meter vertical displacement. We can see that when we use different criteria, actually the collapse resistance of structure from the incremental dynamic analysis idea curve is quite different. So if we have a better criteria, better class simulation uh, capacity, we can more uh, accurately predict the class resistance of this structure. You can see, you can see that this, this is, the, I think, the most interesting figure here. So here shows the final deformation of the structure uh, when we reach the so-defined uh, class criteria. We can see that the first one, the second one, the fourth, third one, the deformation of structure is actually is quite small. It is very far away from the real world class. However, with this real world class criteria, that a vertical displacement is larger than one meter. I think this is uh, makes the class much more easy to understand for anyone, no matter professional people or no professional people. And why we can get this simulation result? Because we have this new algorithm, we can simulate the class behavior much better. Okay, oh, I need to speed up. And uh, the final thing is talking about the dumping we have done recently. Uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Yeah. Shin, you can take as much time you want to. There is no, you have to finish in certain limit. You can take uh, okay. your time. It's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Thanks. 
Okay, so finally come to the dumping that uh, the dumping is a very change question and uh, there's many dumping models like really dumping or model dumping have been proposed. And about all these model dumping have some limitations. And uh, so Dr. Huang have proposed a new uh, uniform dumping model like this one. So you can, this model can give a stable dumping for a certain air, a certain range of the uh, frequency. So we embedded uh, this dumping model. This is uh, the advantage of this dumping model. And uh, we embedded this dumping model into OpenSys. And the dumping model is quite easy to assign to the, to the model. Uh, I, one thing you need to mention that this dumping model can be assigned to different elements. So you have a steel beam, you have a concrete column, you can assign different dumping to different elements. So it will be make the, the, the simulation of the dumping more realistic for the, the structure with different materials. Here is some example. For example, you have a composite uh, frame. You have a, a concrete field steel tube uh, for the column, and you have the shift steel for the beam. So you can see that for the steel, you have 2% of dumping, but for the column, you have 5% of dumping, and you can put all this dumping together. And we can clearly see that uh, the uniform dumping model uh, compared to the existing model that uh, you can have a uh, uh, more uh, realistic behavior for the dumping simulation. The really dumping significantly underestimated the acceleration response. And uh, the uniform dumping and model dumping uh, have similar computation results, but the, the real dumping is uh, much slower. So the uniform dumping model is simple of suitable for structures with different materials. And also this is another example of this we call the progress curve simulation that we have a frame here, we remove one column. So the, the structure will be going to a progress curve from the damaged area ex and extend to different part of this structure. So we can see that we can use different dumping model. The UD means the uniform dumping model and the RD means the really dumping model. So you can see that for really dumping model, we generally select two frequencies, but we have different uh, options to select the different frequencies. And we can find that the comparison issue here that uh, if you use the really dumping, if you use this, uh, this 1.6 Hertz to 4.8 Hertz, you can see that actually that the, uh, the, the structure will not vibrate because that the really dumping will be overestimate the dumping ratio for very high uh, vibration mode. And if you cover a very big stage, you can see that the dumping will be quite strange because that uh, it will be uh, underestimated the dumping ratio between that and overestimated the dumping ratio after this uh, frequency. But with this uh, uniform dumping ratio, we can always get a very stable result. So this is the advantage of this new dumping model. Yeah. So I can see that that is the advantage of that. And also another example is that for this super, top, uh, uh, <coughs> super long bridge, that you can see that the, 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 the vibration, vibration period of this main span will be much longer than the vibration period of this tower. And uh, for the really dumping, it's quite challenging to select which uh, two frequency you want to use to control the, um, the dumping of the structure. But with the uniform dumping model, we can see that it is uh, uh, much easier to control this uh, uh, rich body movement and give a, give, a, give a better result for this simulation. And uh, the formal topic is about the simulation for the single structure and we also want to extend this technology for a uh, uh, regional area. And uh, that is, uh, I have mentioned that we want to do the non-linear time experiences for the entire city. And this kind of city, we want it to be accurate, uh, we want it to be efficient, and we want it to be realistic because the one we're working with the city, we are not only working with engineers, we need to work with uh, many no professional users. So that is why we need to make this simulation realistic. And uh, so here is the, the fundamental idea. We have the uh, ground motion input. We build the struct dynamics model for the millions or tens of thousands of buildings in the city. And with uh, the time history analysis, we can following the fundamental struct dynamics, 
we can represent the behavior of different buildings and also the char characteristics of different earthquakes. So here is the model we use. For some uh, multi-story buildings, we can use the, the multi-degree of freedom shear model for this uh, uh, lower rise building. And for some tall buildings, because the deformation mode of the structure is the flex shear deformation coupled mode. So we can use the MDF flex shear coupled mode. And these two models, because they, both of them are based on the multi-degree of freedom model, we use the mo moderate for density model. We call it moderate for density model. Of course, some of the special buildings in the city they are quite different from the, the, the simple ones. So we can use a very detailed model to simulate structure, and we call it a high fidelity model. And uh, for example, if we want to simulate this structure, that uh, we, uh, we use the multi-degree freedom model. So we can have the moderate workload. We can simulate the high order vibration and the vast pulse of the ground motions. And we can know the damage on different stories. But uh, when we're working on the city, we cannot know the detailed drawing of different buildings. So we generally we only have some, we call the GPS data, that is some uh, global information of the structure. For example, the structure type, the height, the construction year, the functionality of this building. So we want to use this uh, GPS data to predict the uh, structure parameters of this top building. Uh, for example, if we have a reinforced concrete frame, uh, we want to know the interstory behavior. Uh, for this multi-degree freedom model, we need to know the mass on different story. We want to know the in initial stiffness of different story, the yield strength, the peak strength, the yield displacement, peak displacement, and also the pinching behavior. So we need to know all these material, uh, all these mechanical mod uh, parameters from this. Uh, GIS data, then how we do the work, and we prepare post uh, methodology. So the fundamental idea is that, for example, uh, we want to know the math, then we know the functionality of the building, so we can know the math of uh, uh, unit area, and we know the area of this building, then we can predict the math of different story. And also that we know the empirical vibration period of this building, and then, we can use the math and the empirical vibration period. We can predict the interstory stiffness of this MDF model. And I come to the strength parameters. So we know the design code, and we can use the design code to predict the design strength of different stories. And then we can use some parameters from the uh, existing literature or from a lot of uh, Push over result, we can predict the yield strength and the peak strength of the interstory behavior. And for the displacement, we know the yield strength, we know the initial stiffness, then we can predict the yield displacement. And then we know the <coughs> peak, uh, the second uh, second stiffness, and then we can know the peak strength, and we can predict the peak, uh, peak displacement of this uh, curve. And also we can from the literature to predict the uh, pinching behavior of this curve. So when we all know all the parameters, we can set up this uh, frame with uh, MDF model of the frame with these parameters. Here are these two examples that we have uh, a frame we test in the laboratory. The, the red one is the test result and the black one is the prediction of our model. We can see that the interstory uh, model predict with our master agree well with the test result. Uh, here is another comparison. And also we can do the similar things for the masonry structures. Uh, we simplify a masonry structure into a MDF shear model. However, because for the masonry structure, some masonry structure are reinforced masonry, so we can use the similar methodology, but use different parameters to uh, determine the uh, parameters of the interstory behavior. And for the iron reinforced memory, we can use a different solution, but we can also get the interstory behavior. And we can also compare our result with the test result and the full scale uh, test result in the laboratory and the results are pretty well aware. Well. And for the top building, the story will be more complicated because that uh, uh, for the uh, low rise building, it only have the interstory shear behavior but for tall building, it only have the interstory behavior, shear behavior 
but also have the interstory intellectual behavior. So here is the, uh, the fundamental idea how we built up the in MDF flexure coupling model for this uh, power building. And uh, here I can see the comparisons that uh, for the building A and building B, two typical power buildings, our uh, MDF model agree quite well with this uh, refined finite energy model so that we can use this model to simulate the behavior of these tall buildings. And also we can compare our result with some monitor results during earthquake. And uh, we can see that the result is still agree quite well with this uh, monitor data. And uh, all these models have been embedded into the uh, Nakhari Sim Center funded by National Science Foundation of the United States. Uh, this uh, already open source and uh, in GitHub, and uh, you can see the detailed uh, uh, procedure of how we set up this model. Uh, here is the entire frame uh, workflow of this uh, simulation. And uh, this, I think this model is still uh, <coughs> supported by Dr. McKenna. And uh, uh, you can see that we need an MDF model to do the structural simulation. So we use the OMC simulation in the middle of this workflow. That is, we form the building information model and uh, from the earthquake event, then we generate a structural model. We call it uh, SAM, structural analysis model. So here is the fundamental parameter of the structural analysis model. And when we have the structural analysis model, then we use the MDF models in OpenSys to do the structural dynamic simulation. And we can predict the engineering demand parameter and we can do it for the city scale simulation. And also that when we finish the simulation, we can combine the EDP with the building information model and with this uh, the loss calculation that we predict the seismic induced loss to this uh, particular building. And uh, this methodology not only can be used for the buildings in China or in the United States, it can also be used for buildings on different countries. For example, that uh, this is what we done together with Professor Ji Dang in Japan, that we use the parameter of Japanese buildings to build up the empty model for Japanese building. So we can use it to do the simulation for Japanese buildings. And uh, further, if we have the detailed uh, information of the uh, buildings, then we can further generate the detailed structure model and predict the interstory behavior. And then we can determine the interstory behavior of this empty model. So we can see, make our simulation much more accurate. Uh, here is an example that uh, this is the Ludian earthquake in China. And uh, after the earthquake, we get the ground motion, we get the building information, and we input the ground motion into our nonlinear city scale time history analysis. And here get we our result. So here is the actual damage. Here is our model prediction. So the different color represent different damage states, and different area represent different proportion of the, the damage state. We can see that uh, our proposed model is much better than the existing models. And uh, this methodology can be used both before stick for the urban planning or disaster preparation, and also can be used for after stick for emergency response. And uh, we can combine this 60 scale linear time heat analysis with this performance scale group. Then we can do it for the seismic loss assessment and also for the seismic resilience uh, assessment. For example, we can we have done it for Tsinghua University, and we can do it. Uh, both for a single building and also for the entire campus. So that is why we call it this presentation multi-scale. So we can do it not only on building scale, on different components, but also on a regional scale. So we can see, okay, this is a large proportion of seismic induced loss is due to the irreparable deformation. So that is the, the similar story with the Christchurch. And I think this is what we need for the resilience. And uh, we, when we first further extended this technology, only only for not only for one campus, but for the entire Beijing city, then we can do it for the entire Beijing city. You can see that uh, 
we firstly simulate earthquake, MHG of eight earthquake in Beijing, and we know the damage to this uh, six, uh, <coughs> 68,000 uh, residential buildings. And then we simulate the repair uh, procedure of the entire city. And then we can know that uh, the uh, optimized work distribution in the city. So uh, in different days, uh, how the distribution of these workers on different areas. Okay. And also we can use this technology for some secondary disaster simulation that we use this technology to first simulate the damage to the buildings and we combine this with the ignition model and the fire spread model so we can simulate the fire <coughs> first, uh, fire falling earthquake in the entire city area. For example, this is what we did for the Taiwan city. You can see that the arrow the air pointed is the area that the fire, fire ignition, and this arrow shows the wind speed. So with this wind speed, you can see the fire spread among different buildings in this city. And we can not only see the fire spread in the city, but we can buy this fire uh, falling earthquake simulation with this uh, uh, computer fluid dynamic simulation. We can see, okay, here is the, the uh, smoke of the fire falling earthquake in the entire city area. Of course, we don't know what will happen to the Taiwan city after this earthquake, but here is the photo after the Kobe earthquake. This is the photo of Kobe city after the earthquake. You can see that uh, the simulation is quite similar to the actual uh, fire situation of this city. And this technology has been used in many different cities an area, for example, in Beijing or in Tangshan and the Taiwan the cities in China. And uh, this technology can also be used for the post-earthquake assessment. So in traditional ways, we use uh, this uh, uh, ground motion <coughs> uh, uh, intensities and the fragility curve to predict the seismic loss, but they will introduce many uh, uncertainties. And uh, with our technology, we can use the recorded ground motion and time history analysis to make the result much more accurate. So <clears throat> we developed a software called the real-time earthquake damage assessment using city scale time history analysis. We call it the red act. So every time there is an earthquake happens, we get the ground motion, we input the ground motion into the building inventory and do the city scale time history analysis, and we can know the seismic damage on different area with different damage proportion. You can see that the yellow means the moderate damage, the light green means slight damage, and uh, dark green means uh, uh, no damage. You can see clearly see the, the, the consequence after the earthquake. Now here is a, a typical example that <clears throat> in 2014, uh, sorry, 2017, there is a magnitude of seven earthquakes in China. And after the earthquake, some agencies use a traditional method to predict that there will be tens of thousands of buildings will collapse. But now after the earthquake, our model gave the prediction that there is a very small possibility of collapse. So you can see that these two results is quite different with each other. And here is the site investigation report after the earthquake. They said that there is about uh, <coughs> 73,000 building damage, but only 76 building collapse. So this uh, result is quite, agree quite well with our prediction, and uh, our prediction is much, much better than the traditional way. And we need to <coughs> note, it was noting that this prediction is done just after the earthquake. We don't know what really happens. We just gave our prediction, and this is the prediction agree quite well with the actual situation. So this technology has been uh, uh, used uh, very well in China. And you can see that there is uh, more than 60 domestic earthquakes. And also we use this technology for the predicted the seismic damage on different area, <coughs> different countries. This is the Anchorage earthquake in 2018. So this is uh, just an hour, two hours after we get the ground motion. And we can, this is the report we can we, we give. You, you still can download the, this report from the PIA, Pacific Earthquake Engineer Research website. Uh, this is our prediction. You can compare our report, uh, compare our prediction with the real seismic damage. And this is the 2019 
<coughs> which crest earthquake. This is our prediction one hour after the earthquake. And uh, you can also compare our prediction with the, the real situation. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the prediction is uh, uh, very well. And also, uh, we use this technology together with our friends in the United States for the seismic uh, damage simulation for the Bay Area, so that uh, the UC Berkeley connected the, the building inventory in the Bay Area with 1.8 million buildings. And also, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory have uh, done the scenario simulation for a magnitude of seven earthquake in the Howard Fault. So input the ground motion into the 1.8 million buildings so that uh, we can simulate the, uh, the shaking of the entire downtown San Francisco in this earthquake. And we can also use the similar technology to simulate the uh, fire falling earthquake in downtown San Francisco. So uh, that is uh, what we call the, the multi-scale simulation that we can bring beginning from the component scale to the building scale, and finally come to the, the entire city scale simulation. And uh, OpenSys can provide us a very useful tool to finish this dynamic simulation. Okay, so, so that's all for my presentation, but I think we still need quite a, a lot of work to do that, uh, for example, that uh, we also, with a bigger and a bigger model, we also want our model to be more faster and uh, that for the dynamic uh, simulation, we want to the uh, time step more flexible. So uh, we also need some better concrete um, models and uh, uh, different material models. And uh, when we come to large scale cities, we also need better, better building models. And uh, we have some functionality for buildings, but it's still far away from sufficient. So uh, this is all the students involved in our simulation and uh, their uh, uh, contribution acknowledge here. And uh, the formal simulation have already uh, written in this book. It have already published by Springer. So we published the first version in 2017. And uh, in this February, we passed, uh, published the second version of this book, a second edition of this book. So you can buy it from the Springer or from Amazon. So the issue, all the details of, of my presentation. So that's all my from presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And do you have, anyone has any questions? I mean, it was really amazing. I'm pretty sure it's going to be useful for a lot of people. And I can already see, I know like in New Zealand also, we are trying to do similar for Wellington and all that areas, like, mm -hmm. Uh, the whole city-wide modeling. I knew that some of the capabilities of OpenSys, but I didn't know in this depth and this scale. That's awesome to know. And yeah, any questions from anyone? The audience. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Amazing job. And uh, I have two questions about it. First is uh, about uh, the Uniform damping model you referred about it. Uh, I want, uh, could you um, set to that uh, slide? Yeah, I'm moving to that. Okay, okay. Uh, I wonder uh, I, I, I wonder if this uniform damping model is related to the, uh, uh, to the stiffness of the model. Uh, because I, I, I've read some paper says uh, the relay damping ratio is sensitive to the initial stiffness and uh, tangent stiffness uh, about the results. Uh, How about this model? Uh, I think this model is uh, not, uh, uh, because the relay damping actually, this is not a real world uh, dumping matrix is a combination of the mass matrix and the stiffness matrix. So they will be sensitive to the uh, stiffness of the structure. But for this uh, uh, uniform dumping, you can see that they have no relation to the, the stiffness matrix so that it will be more adaptive to different uh, nonlinear state, stage. So that's my, my, question, uh, my answer to your question. Okay, okay. So, 
so what, what is this uniform damping uh, model comes from? Comes from the real uh, component behavior? Yeah, actually that uh, there's many different reasons for the damping. Uh, uh, there's two things. First, uh, you need to give a damping ratio to different element or different material. So this is a, a challenging question and uh, many people have done many work on that. And uh, what, what we are doing is that we use this uh, uh, model, we use this model to give a uh, accurate representation of the dumping ratio you input. So first thing you need to have a dumping ratio and secondly, you need to agree them to really accurately represent this dumping ratio. What we did is that we make this uh, dumping model to more accurately represent this dumping ratio. Uh, but <laughs> how okay. you get to this dumping ratio, this will be another challenging question. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know that, that most of the dumping ratio is based on the experimental results till now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, another question is, uh, I've noticed that in OpenSys website, there are uh, quite a lot of uh, pre-processing um, software or tools about uh, the OpenSys. So the purpose for you, your group, to invent a new uh, pre-process -pre uh, tool uh, is why, why are you trying to invent a new one? Oh, oh yeah so so this is uh, this is uh, when we are working on this topic we have a no pre or post process too so we have to develop some method to build up this complete model and after that people see the opportunity of open source to simulate the real world big structure but they demand for a better pre process tools so some company have started working on it to develop the uh, pre-process too. So this is, <laughs> we okay, do it okay. first, then people come to working on that. So this work is done, I think seven years ago. So, so that is the, the, the story. I think they have, uh, the, you look at the website, they have already proposed some very good uh, pre-process too. I think that uh, it yeah, makes yeah. people much yeah, much convenient to be using open this. But uh, seven years ago, this is totally different story. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from anyone? Usually, like, people are like, so they keep asking once someone starts, so it's not like... No problem. That uh, yeah, I have already yeah, show my 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 contact information in yeah. our uh, in the slider, so people can like yeah. email or use this. Uh, I, I have a, I have a couple of questions. Like uh, so, what was the runtime for these large scale models? Even after improving the speed, like you developed all these tools for the models, right? So if you have to run like uh, a huge like Shanghai Tower model in OpenSys, how long does it take? And how do you run like in parallel processing or domain decomposition or like straight up one model or how is that done? Uh, yeah, I, I, actually that I, uh, as I mentioned to you that uh, uh, this work uh, have done some years ago. At that time, we, when we use the GPU acceleration, then we can finish the simulation in about 24 hours, no, 27 hours. But if we, if we don't use the GPU acceleration, then we have to do the simulation with more than 400 hours. Oh. So that is uh, the huge difference. But of course, that uh, uh, with this, this, this work is done uh, seven years ago. So I think uh, people must have some better solution now to make the simulation faster. Yeah. So you ran these models in parallel computing or like straight one single model and you did it? Uh, I think that uh, at that time when we do the simulation for the, when we do the simulation that uh, uh, overseas their server can only support uh, do it uh, with a single CPU. Oh. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And uh, 
so you you use the several shell elements and uh, connection elements right so i mean i was just curious how did you model like uh, like for example the slabs did you use shell elements for the slabs or only shear walls or like how did you you connected just connected using rigid elements in these tall buildings how did you do that like i was just curious how did you model the each component represent each component in the buildings here yeah you can see that here shows the figure that we can mesh the shear wall the coupling beams in in many smaller shear elements so we can okay. see the element with different opening or different shapes yes but what about the slabs for example in this case Ah uh, yeah, slab is uh, we have two options. I think that for this example that we use the shear element to simulate the slab, and for some examples that you can directly use the the the, the constraints to represent the the contribution of the slab to the to the different components. Okay. Yeah, because I was because do you do this? I mean. you did the analysis but can you do design or something like that i was thinking but looks like no yet like for example like a finite element software you do like the reinforcement strains and deflections and all that stuff right for the slabs uh, i read uh, i read some papers they are using the 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 the, the material sharement to simulate the slabs and uh, uh, they, from their report that Uh, the, the result is uh, the quite good. Of course, you take more time to to do the simulation with this uh, uh, shear element. Yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, anyone? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, we have a question here. How can we use GPU for computation? Do we need to install any software besides OpenSys? Is it possible to use <laughs> GPU computation in OpenSys? Yeah, yeah. I think I have already talked to you before the presentation. That yeah. Actually, okay. so uh, firstly, you need to use have a, a GPU support CUDA, and you need to install the CUDA library. Library, and then you can combine the 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 the, the open source and run it with CUDA. The challenging thing here is that the 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 library of CUDA is updating quickly. So we proposed a solution uh, with the GPU server based on CUDA 5.0. So if you use the CUDA 5.0, it's okay. But if you go to the higher version of CUDA, I don't know what will happen because the, the software is keep changing. But if you use CUDA 5.0, you can see that the, the acceleration is quite e efficient and the code is already open sourced in, uh, in the OpenSense website. Any other questions from you guys? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, hi, Dr. Zheng. I'm Hadi. Uh, I'm a mm -hmm. PhD student at uh, Queen's University in Canada. Uh, I'm okay. working on uh, slabs. Uh, as uh, uh, my friend asked questions about slabs, I, I was I couldn't get my answer. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is it possible to? You talked about different types of uh, multi-layered. I mean, the flat. Uh, elements. Uh, I was wondering, is it possible to get punching crack propagation uh, by modeling the 3D uh, finite element uh, analysis in OpenSys or not using the these new invention that you had added in OpenSys? Oh, I think that uh, for the multi shear element, the fundamental mechanism is that for the this shear element. The different layers follow the plan section in plan assumption. So for the local punching area, you can see they have the diagonal or the inclined crack. So they are not a plan in plan assumption. So for that area, I think that you need to find some new solution for that. But if you go outside the punching area, you need to simulate the entire the global deformation of the slab. Then you can use the shear management and do it very well. So that is my my idea for your question. Uh, you mean uh, uh, something multi-scale? When I go to the connections, slab column connections, I should make it 3D. But for the other parts, I should 
uh, use the 2D beam column elements. Something mm -hmm. like that. You have, you have this, uh, this joint area and the big uh, slab surrounding around this uh, joint area. So this for the joint area, it's, it's not the plane plan assumption, but for the surrounding area that will be. That, uh, because I want to get the, uh, the, the, how to say, the progressive collapse of a big building, but mm -hmm. uh, it is not uh, possible based on my knowledge that I, I read the, in literature. Nobody talked about the slabs in such a way to see the old 3D one, and it is not possible to get, I couldn't get any result, would result in 2D. And uh, I was wondering to define in using some uh, springs, but I could, I, I should define, uh, I should use some uh, uh, solid uh, platforms such as Abacus or uh, I, I don't know, uh, ANSYS to define a backbone. And I couldn't get any uh, good result to define the backbone to and uh, define that backbone in the springs. And then I can use OpenSys for that big uh, structure. Uh, I was wondering, is it possible to use this uh, type of multi-layer plates or not? Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, you can do it with uh, called uh, uh, different mesh that uh, for the joint area, you can do it with some called a component based model that you spring to represent this joint area. And for the surrounding area, of course, you can use this shared and do that. I think uh, Professor Yuan Tian in University of Nevada, Las Vegas, they have published the papers uh, using the similar technology many years ago. Yeah. Thank you so very much. It was really informative and profound. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? Okay, so if there's no more questions, so I think <laughs> I have already used up on my one hour presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah, usually okay. these sessions are like one, one and a half hours. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, okay. thank you so much for your time and presentation. I'm pretty sure like everyone, it's useful for everyone. And yeah. we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your thank invitation. You. And thank you for everyone to come here. I wish you have a good morning or good night, good evening. Okay, yeah. bye. <laughs> bye.